Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Thank you so much for joining us. We kick off our program um, with Dr. Thomas Birch, infectious disease specialist and medical director of the Institute for Clinical Research at Holy Name Medical Center. Uh, good to see you, doctor. Hi, Steve. It's good to join you. Um, doctor, we've had many conversations with folks from, um, from Holy Name, and one of the issues that I want to jump into right away is this monoclonal antibody treatment. What is it, and why is the work going on around it so important connected to COVID? Yes, I think you've probably seen advertisements for monoclonal antibodies, so everyone's using the term right now. Normally, antibodies may be directed at many different proteins on bacteria or viruses, but in this case, it's a single antibody. All the antibodies are exactly the same type, so that's why we call them monoclonal, like a clone. And they're made in the laboratory, and they're directed specifically against the spike protein of the COVID coronavirus. And so they have a very high level of activity in binding virus and eliminating it from the body. Let me ask you this. How, I'm curious as to who I'm looking at right now. There were originally 1,400 patients with monoclonal antibodies, right? Um, they, got, they, said that they say it's working, but my question is, who's eligible for it, who's not, and how is that evolving, doctor? Well, originally there were the patients in the studies, and now we have an expanded use authorization, which is a special emergency authorization from the FDA, from the Food and Drug Administration, okay, right. that allows us to give the antibodies to people who are at high risk for developing complications from COVID. So those include people who are elderly, over 65, or people who are over 55 with other conditions like hypertension, or people of any age with diabetes or obesity or certain ethnic groups that are at high risk of complications. And we are allowed to use our clinical judgment as physicians in terms of who to treat. And so that's extremely helpful because not all of the people who have complications come from these high risk groups. But in general, if you're older and have other medical problems and you contract COVID, it's very important to get the antibodies promptly. Let me ask you, and by the way, let me, let me share that the Holy Name Medical Center is a healthcare uh, supporter of what we do, an underwriter of what we are doing in terms of public awareness around health-related issues. But I'm curious about this, doctor. There are a lot of people that right now watching, not just in New Jersey, but surrounding states, that just don't believe. I hear things like, and by the way, we're taping on the 22nd of June. Listen, COVID's in the rearview mirror. It's passed. And by the way, if you get sick, you're not going to get really sick. And, and listen, for those of us who are vaccinated, A, I want to know about whether, how protected we are. B, for those who are not, what's your message to them right now? Well, those are quite a few good questions that you've asked there. And much of COVID is in the rearview mirror for the moment. But if you look at the spike that we had in the spring of 2020, and then the spike over the winter of 2021, they both declined very abruptly when spring came and we went outdoors and we stopped being inside together. And COVID, although it was initially not a seasonal illness, is now declaring itself as more of a seasonal illness like influenza and various other respiratory viruses. And so the rate of decline we could attribute to the vaccine, which is good, and I'm sure it's a contributor, but it's not the whole explanation because last year it declined rapidly and there are still about 25% of people who are unvaccinated and have not had COVID and therefore are susceptible. That's a large enough group of people to get sick and we do continue to see them coming to the emergency department and clinics and sometimes getting admitted to the hospital. And some people are still having severe or critical disease that lands them up in the ICU and on a ventilator and so this is not over. I wish it was over, and I wish we had a way to make it go away promptly, but I think we have to confront the facts that it has changed from epidemic, which is the high and uncontrolled levels of infection, to endemic, which is sort of low level bumping along through the community, through the months of the year, with your number coming up if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time or just unlucky. So I think we have to be respectful of that. I certainly am. In addition, although these 
vaccines are outstanding and much better than we ever expected, both better tolerated and much more effective than we even hoped for, they are not 100%. So if you look at the 95% protection against severe and critical illness that's provided by the messenger RNA vaccines, that's still one out of 20 people who get exposed who are going to get severe or critical illness. That means in the hospital and maybe in the ICU. So one out of 20 is not that great a number. In addition, the vaccine is considered a success if you get only mild to moderate disease. But mild to moderate disease is still COVID. You can still transmit it to someone else, including someone else who might be quite susceptible and uh, susceptible to the complications. So it's important to maintain respect and do our due diligence to do the right thing. Real quick, we're taping out, as I said, on the 22nd, the uh, end of June, 22nd of June. Do you believe that the vaccine will be made available in the next couple of months? And again, this program will be seen later. We're leading into the school year, the September school year, for children under 12 anytime soon. I think it will. The trials are ongoing now. And children sometimes have complications, and children's, uh, children are a frequent source of transmission because they're so close together in schools and at play. Uh, so it's important to have immunity across the entire population, but we must make sure that it's safe in this group of people. Real quick, before I let you go, um, there are some friends of ours who's, who have daughters or just young women themselves that talk about, I'm not getting, that say, I'm not getting the vaccine because... I'm concerned about its potential impact on my ability to uh, have a child. Is there a direct correlation between um, the vaccine, getting the vaccine, and the ability to have a child? There is no correlation. There's no association with infertility. And if you look at the components of the vaccine, the mRNA lasts in the body for just a few days, two or three days. And the spike protein that is made in response to that RNA is uh, in the body perhaps for two weeks. And then these things are cleared by normal metabolic processes. So a woman's ova are formed at birth and uh, they will not be uh, altered in their development because uh, there just isn't uh, the protein or other RNA uh, influence that is gonna have an impact. There's no connection. There's no connection. Hey doctor, that's important. Thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it, and we'll make sure we continue the conversation with you and other colleagues in the infectious disease arena. Thank you so much, Dr. Birch. You're welcome. It was a pleasure talking with you. Same here. Stay with us. We'll be right back. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSENG, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Bank of America. NJM Insurance Group, Summit Health, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by New Jersey Globe. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever.